to the November 18th, 2019 meeting of the Planning Commission. Uh, can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Berman. Present. Commissioner Campbell. Here. Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Rubenstein. Here. Chair Clifford. Present. Commissioner Niblin. Here. Commissioner Kraske. Here. Commissioner Bigstick. Present. Okay, and uh, we're gonna move on to approval. Uh, uh, excuse me, salute to the flag. And I have been gone so long, I'm going to take this on. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. On to administrative business. Uh, approval of the order of agenda. Do I have a motion for that? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Niblin. I'll move uh, for approval of the order of agenda. Okay. Do I have a second? <laughs> I'll second the motion. Okay. I'll get that off. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. My decent line over here. Oh, excuse me. I have to do that again. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a little fur away from my uh, buttons here for some reason. Okay. Still waiting for one vote to register. Oh. Okay, and that passes unanimously. And moving on to approval of the minutes for September 16th and October 7th. Uh, we can take the, either take them separately or together. So do I have a motion? Uh, Commissioner Bigstick. Um, I don't have a motion yet. The October 7th minutes, there was a slight uh, correction or I'd like to make. Um, should I go ahead with that one and then do them both together? So um, on page 49 and page 50, I think I was comparing uh, cannabis and alcohol in that, and it's not clear the way it was written, so I just wanted to clarify in a couple of places. Um, the last paragraph, uh, it looks like the second paragraph from the bottom. Um, it's the sentence that ends, he might argue that is more pernicious and a lot easier for youth to get a hold of it. In this case, the it I'm referring to is alcohol. Um, on the next page, the first full sentence, he didn't believe in the stigma that some are attaching to the substance, the substance being cannabis on the one hand and on the other hand, a substance that probably, in this case, that substance is alcohol. Um, and then the very last sentence in that paragraph uh, ends with the last line undercuts black market where there is a bigger risk to children and that should be a than rather than a that. Okay. So if we could just uh, make that slight amendment, I'd be happy to make a motion to approve the minutes in both cases. Okay, thank you very much and I have two possible seconds. Commissioner Rubenstein. I was just going to make the motion to oh, okay. approve the minutes. Would, would you uh, be willing to make the second? Yes. Okay. We have a motion and a second on the, uh, the minutes uh, with those corrections. Please vote. <coughs> okay, and that passes unanimously. Uh, next up is a designation of a liaison to the City Council meeting on November 25th. Um, 
And do I have any volunteers for that? It's the 1726 Palmetto Ave appeal. And uh, staff want to tell us a little bit about what the appeal, what's being appealed? I'm, I'm, I, I don't know what 1726 means. So generally it was uh, location, proximity to sensitive uses um, and neighborhood impacts. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Commissioner Nivlin? I, I was wondering if I could get a sense from staff of when on the agenda, is that anticipated to be a little after seven? I, I have a, another function at, at the Resource Center that'll probably have me tied up until about seven or so. You know, I believe it is the, the only and first public hearing. Oh, is it? No. Yeah. Well, again, I, I think that I could probably um, cover that if no one else is inclined to. I, I, again, I have a... It'd be probably better if someone else did, but um, I can cover it if no one else is uh, it's prepared It's my birthday. To. I'm not going. Very good. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll be down in the area anyway, I suppose. Okay. Commissioner Bigstick? Um, I do intend on being at that meeting, and I certainly can't act as liaison if you are not there at the time, though I think um, since the way you made the motion, it would be preferable if you were to act as liaison, but I um, have every confidence I can fill that role if you're not able to make it. Well, well, if folks are okay, then what, what we could do is designate, uh, if the, if my fellow commissioners are okay with it, myself as the liaison for the matter with uh, Commissioner Big Stick backing me up if I'm unable to make it. Uh, that sounds perfectly fine with me. <coughs> um, so we'll, we'll do it that way. Sure. So we have, we have uh, a, desig a designated uh, uh, <coughs> Commissioner Niblin at, with a backup of Commissioner Big Stick. Now moving on to oral communications. This portion of the agenda is available to the public to address the Planning Commission on any issue within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Commission that is not on the agenda. This time, the time allotted for any speaker will be three minutes. Is there anybody who wishes to speak on anything that is not on tonight's agenda? Seeing no one, I'm going to close oral communications. We have no consent items and we're down to our consideration item, which is discussion of the existing report, existing conditions report for the Sharp Park specific plan. Uh, can we have a staff report on that? Good evening, commissioners. I'm senior planner Christian Murdoch. I'm joined this evening by associate planner Bonnie O'Connor, as well as Allison Moore from the city's consultant Diet and Batia. We have been the core team working on the Plan Pacifica effort, which some of you may already be familiar with. For those who may not be as familiar, Plan Pacifica is a three-part effort the city is undertaking to update its general plan, update its local coastal program, and create a new Sharp Park specific plan. The Commission participated in joint study sessions with the City Council in August and September, which focused on the general plan and LCP updates. However, tonight is our first public meeting focusing on the Sharp Park specific plan process, and so we are excited to be here tonight uh, to update you and the community. <coughs> The effort to create a Sharp Park specific plan reflects the City Council's interest and the interest of many in the community to work towards a revitalized Sharp Park area. The City has been undertaking or planning to undertake significant public improvements in the Sharp Park area, such as planning for a new Sharp Park library, redeveloping the former wastewater treatment plant, and constructing phase one of the Palmetto Streetscape project. However, there is a need to unify these and other efforts to have the greatest impact in the area. That is where the Sharp Park specific plan can make a meaningful contribution. As you can imagine, there are many incremental steps involved in creating a planning document like the Sharp Park specific plan. The Plan Pacifica team has been working hard on the early steps of the process by conducting research and interviews to prepare the existing conditions report or ECR, which is the focus of tonight's meeting. The ECR is an essential and it, uh, rather, the ECR is an initial assessment of the Sharp Park area to capture the current state of affairs related to characteristics like land uses, architectural design, transportation, and infrastructure. The ECR is an important document because it will inform the development of land use concepts to respond to the issues and opportunities identified in the ECR. Allison, our consultant, is going to take us through some more information about the Sharp Park specific plan process, how we prepared the ECR, and what we have found initially. Thank you, Christian. Commissioners, I'm Allison Moore. Nice to meet you. Um, 
Thank you for the opportunity tonight to share more about the Sharp Park specific plan. Um, I will first go through what the process has been so far, um, public outreach and opportunities to participate now. Um, a quick overview of the issues within the existing condition report, and then um, at the end, we'd appreciate your input on any other issues that you feel are important to address in analyzing Sharp Park's existing conditions and developing the plan. Um, so just as a quick recap, the Sharp Park neighborhood has potential for growing vibrancy, and there's opportunity here for mixed-use buildings, new housing, and higher-intensity development that will help the city address issues of housing affordability and creating a center of gravity. Specific plans are tools for development and preservation uh, that also implement the, general's plan, the general plan's policies. Because the area is, is within the coastal zone, it will also be consistent with the local the local coastal program. Specific plans, as their name suggests, offer specificity on the vision and development potential of an area. Specific plans can also be very useful to agencies in setting realistic development expectations and to developers in helping to size the potential and cost of development. We're currently in the visioning and issue identification phase of this process. The intent of this phase is to combine background research, so the existing conditions report and market st demand study, and community engagement to establish a foundation for the plan's vision and goals. The next phase, the land use concepts and key strategies, will help community members and decision makers visualize and evaluate potential approaches to land use, connectivity, and urban design in the planning area. This input will help the planning team arrive at the preferred plan and policy framework, the draft pl plan phase, um, which then will serve as the basis for the full plan. Public outreach for this visioning phase has included multiple channels of input. These include prompts for Sharp Park visioning at the five neighborhood meetings in July, stakeholder interviews with business owners, representatives of nonprofits, developers, landowners, and community members, pop-up outreach at the Coastside Farmers Market, and two current, currently active opportunities to participate include taking the Sharp Park online survey and an opportunity to comment on the existing conditions report. Both of these are available on the Plan Pacifica website. And in the back, there's also a handout with the website and a handout with a summary of existing conditions um, findings. Um, so at the neighborhood meetings in July, <coughs> A few common themes included recognition of Sharp Park's potential, especially in light of the Palmetto Avenue improvements. Um, participants at these meetings noted support for mixed uses in the area and emphasized placemaking that created a draw. They also mentioned a desire for compatibility with existing homes and frequently described Sharp Park as a place where cultural and natural resources are important assets. Today, we'd also like to discuss adequacy of the ex existing conditions report in documenting our baseline for the Sharp Park area. So the existing conditions report and accompanying market demand study outline the trends, issues, and opportunities within Sharp Park so that the community can envision potential for its future. So just a quick overview of some of the top line findings. Um, so the land use chapter utilized development information from the city, county assessor's data, and existing plans and regulations. This chapter is supported by information in the market demand study, which provides an overview of demographic and real estate market conditions and trends. Consistent with public input thus far, the ECR identifies intensification of commercial, recreational, and visitor serving uses as needed to create this center of gravity. Its existing density and current mix of uses makes it a suitable area for more housing and housing that is available at all levels of income. New development opportunities include residential or mixed use infill on vacant or opportunity sites, which we define as parcels where the owner may have incentive to redevelop, and redevelopment of large publicly owned parcels. Um, but there are a few sites in the area that are small and may need policies to encourage development. Finally, in the land use chapter, standards for mixed use development that reflect market realities will be needed. For the urban design chapter, a few key findings include the need for additional public realm improvements, notably more street furniture. And some of the assessments that we did, we saw one man sitting on a fire hydrant instead of you know, a bench. And uh, policies aimed at decreasing gaps in street frontages so that the street feels more lively and pedestrian friendly. 
There's also a need for wayfinding to amenities and the area as a whole, and a solid branding campaign would enhance the area's feel as a destination. To analyze access, connectivity, and parking, our transportation subconsultant analyzed parking patterns and levels of service for key intersections. As the area's population and number of visitors grows, policies <coughs> will be needed to address parking and traffic, to promote other means of transportation, including bikes and microtransit, and to ensure safe pedestrian routes and coastal pathways. For infrastructure, we utilize input from public utilities, um, the North Coast County Water District's capital improvement plans, vulnerability assessments, and other master plans. We found that infrastructure is adequate to meet growth, and while utilities may be vulnerable to sea level rise, plan policies will include coastal resilience measures um, that are enumerated in the local coastal plan. Finally, Environmental Resources and Hazards uses the latest publicly available data that we drew from the general, plas general plan drafts EIR sources, and all of these issues and others will be addressed fully as part of the environmental review phase of this project. So now we would like to invite your input and guidance on how to refine the existing conditions report and any other issues that you feel are important to include as part of this plan process. Thank you, Allison. So, commissioners, it's our hope that after receiving Allison's presentation and hearing public comment, the commission can help us to understand if we've covered the relevant factors to describe the current conditions in the Sharp Park area and what, if anything, we may need to take another look at. Our thanks to the commission and to the community for their time reviewing the ECR and participating in tonight's meeting. Thank you. I, I would like to talk with staff about the possibility of going ahead, opening things up to the public so that they can inform our discussion and then, uh, then we discuss and then possibly opening it up again for the public to again uh, comment on what, where, we're, where we're going. Sure, I don't think we see any problem with that. It's not a public hearing, and so we don't have the stricture in terms of the form and due process consideration. So uh, ensuring that the commission gets what it feels like it needs in terms of public feedback sounds like a good approach from, from staff. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and open the, the a public part of this uh, discussion and go ahead and call up uh, Jerry Crow. Good evening, commissioners and staff. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I've read over the report and it's an impressive product. I have a couple of items for your possible consideration, however. On page 144, there's a paragraph under section 6.2, cultural resources. The paragraph is labeled historic resources. Uh, the first sentence, says the planning area features one site listed on the National Register of Historic Places. We did apply, but we were not successful at that time. So I would say it's the uh, Pacific Coast Side Museum or Little Brown Church is not yet on the National Register. Then a little further down the third line from the bottom reads, the Pacific Historical Society purchased restored and incorporated the Little Brown Church into the Pacific Ecoside Museum. Actually, we lease the building from the city, so it remains uh, in the, the public realm. That being said, if we back up a little bit to page 79, and includes a paragraph reading public and community facilities. Um, it doesn't mention the Pacific Coastside Museum because it's classified a little further on as just a plain church. I think it might be appropriate to include that possibly right after Pacifica City Hall. On the following page, there is a summary of existing land uses and under the portion of that chart that is labeled public and community facilities uh, is the word church. And I think that would, reply, would refer to the Pacific Coast Side Museum and we would appreciate the mention of the title if possible. 
On the following page, it's a map, uh, page 81, the color code for the parcel on which the little round church sits is um, classified, it's green, so it's classified the same as a building still in use as a church, when actually its full use is the Pacifica Coastside Museum. And uh, as I said before, it's in the public realm. So thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, sir. Uh, Pat Kramer. Good evening, I'm Patricia McCarthy Kramer. I was a resident of Sharp Park until I graduated from Oceana High School. Then I lived away for about 40 years to return 10 years ago to my childhood home. I read with interest the current conditions report, which includes most all of West Sharp Park plus Eureka Square and a few other SNPs. There are a few points I think are important to make in response to this report. This area is claimed as the historic district, but the designation of unutilized, underutilized in figure 2.3 bothers me. It appears that two of our oldest and most historic buildings, Anderson's Store at the corner of Oceana and Paloma and Winner's Tavern, corner of Francisco and Paloma, are given that designation underutilized. This displays an insensitivity to what is really historic about West Sharp Park. In the report, there's a lot of emphasis on current and potential housing density. In fact, I think there's too much emphasis on housing density and not enough on building height. The historic district of West Sharp Park is characterized by many small beach cottages and bungalows. Building lots were originally quite small. I believe they were either 25 or 30 feet by 100. And many houses still retain their original footprints and roof lines from 60 to 100 years ago. There is, in fact, a certain look that is characteristic of this historic district of Pacifica. Although we are certainly not Carmel by the sea, there are certain similar characteristics with Carmel. There are a lot of small bungalows in the area built on small lots. This afternoon, I did an informal survey of the area. Uh-oh. You got one moment. Oh, okay. Informal survey of the area bounded on the north by Paloma, on the south by San Jose. I did not include structures on beach, Palmetto, or Francisco. I looked at 120 structures in all. 36% were small bungalow type structures. 45% were either larger or newer, but had the same aesthetic and were not visually disruptive next to bungalows. The remaining 19% were destructive visually. Most three-story apartments and duplexes with very uninteresting design. Thankfully, these structures do not dominate the neighborhood. The overall look is one of low rise, small houses, the look I remember from my childhood. I want to be emphatic. If we're going to retain the historic look of this district, we must retain its bungalow character. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kathleen Manning. Hi, Kathleen Manning from uh, representing the Pacifica Historical Society. Already am. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that was fast. Uh, the Historical Society is totally committed to a lively and wonderful future for Sharp Park because, of course, as you know, we have our Coastside Museum at the Little Brown Church. We have plans uh, to uh, move our railroad car to West Sharp Park, which we hope will enhance the future of West Sharp Park because we think it'll be attractive for tourists and for local citizens. It's a wonderful piece of history. We hope to move it in close proximity to the current Coastside Museum, AKA Little Brown Church. There is a lot across the street that we would love 
to put the train on and maybe do something there. If we can't do that, we'd like something in close proximity because if we're going to run, we can't run two museums, but if we have them close to each other, it's possible that we can maintain two museums. So anyways, that's what our plans and what our thoughts are and why we are happy to be part of the plans for making uh, West Sharp Park in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deidre Crow. Good evening. My name is Deidre Crow, and I've called Pacifica my hometown since 1954. Um, I'd like to impress that once the car is completed, and we hope within the next two years, that it'll be an economic draw to West Shore Park and to Pacifica as a whole from the rail fan community. And these people, there are rail, rail fans all over the western United States, and they foam at the mouth. When they know there's a new railroad museum, they come flocking. And we'll have an opportunity to host them and um, participate in the revenue increase that's brought by their enthusiasm and their population. If there's any questions, please don't hesitate to contact the Historical Society. We're happy to answer and keep you informed and updated on our progress. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And uh, Gil Shoemaker, Gil or Gail? Gail, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, my name is Gail Benton Shoemaker, and I'm part of a citizens group called Tree City Pacifica. We've been working to help Pacifica become a Tree City USA so that Pacifica will have a better advantage in getting grants for planting and maintaining trees. Many of us were very dismayed when trees were eliminated from the Palmetto streetscape um, the first time around. If you look at successful downtowns in Half Moon Bay or Pleasanton or Mountain View, um, even South San Francisco, they're all tree-lined streets. So, trees actually improve retail sales, research shows, by around 13%. And so not having trees on Palmetto um, seems a little short-sighted in terms of long-term success and drawing the public to Palmetto. I'm hoping to hear, I've been very confused about phase one and phase two, I'm hoping to hear that phase two means that trees will be added to Palmetto, but if not, please consider that. Thank you. And thank you. That's my last card if anybody else wants to speak. Ah. <clears throat> Go ahead, Cindy. Yeah. So, um, hello, I haven't had a chance to read the whole document, had a busy weekend, so didn't have the time. Um, but I'm so glad that um, Pat Kramer did what she did of going around and counting up the number of small cottages that are in parts of the residential area of West Sharp Park, because that's been on my list for a while. So thank you for doing that. Um, I think that's really important to consider as we talk about West Sharp Park. One thing that in some of the areas that I was able to scan was that while it pulled out a couple of larger buildings that are known to be of a certain age, um, what was not really highlighted very much is that the existing houses look to be a, about 7% of the housing stock that are built before 1939. So more than just what is listed as the Coastside Museum at the Little Brown Church and the one house that's listed and a couple of other buildings, there's a lot more in this part of town that's significant. Jerry Crow does a walking tour and talks about all the history that's in the area. So I think that's really important to get more focus on this really unique area in a very compact area. I'm concerned about some of the conversation here that talks about um, intensity. And so I would like to hear what people think intensity means. 
Um, I'm concerned that intensity takes away the character and flavor of this historic area that, as we've heard from some of the others, are small beachside cottages and bungalows. That's what makes this unique. And so um, would love to hear your thoughts about it, including there's a statement here in the planning issues and implications about developing a cohesive visual identity and branding scheme for the area. And that's not what's been happening lately. The recent buildings that have been approved with one exception are very modern, very big, and very out of scale with a community that was built as small scale residential with lots that are quite often 25 feet wide. So um, I think that that needs some additional focus. It's in the numbers, but it's not very much called out in the narrative. Um, there's also a comment in there, just as a little FYI, about how um, things are, that Pacifica in general is a certain number of temperatures and warmer in the summer. That is not true for West Shark Park. So I would um, like to suggest that maybe a little bit more specificity and when we're thinking about things here, summer here is very chilly. Um, it's traditionally the, a time of my highest electric, or my highest heating bill. So thank you for, love to hear your comments now. Thank you. Okay, I am now going to bring it back to the commission and Commissioner Big Stick, your light was uh, the first one on. I turned it on before the comments, but I'll be happy to go first. Um, before I go into anything of actual substance, just a quick editorial note, page 113, it occurred to me probably should have been placed about page 75. So, okay. Um, going first to the feedback I heard, um, history is the big feedback I just heard now. And um, maybe you can go into it a little bit in terms of um, what it means to make something a historic district. Um, I know that housing absolutely is a big question mark on at least my mind, and I would venture probably all of our minds, but um, when we're talking about um, housing and maybe making certain areas more intense to be able to accommodate affordable housing um, where it would be appropriate to delineate between where we should place housing versus what a historic area um, means in terms of planning and how we kind of keep them separate even though in theory perhaps they could wind up in the same lot space, so I have more questions, but do you want to touch on? Well, I'll try to unpack some of that. I don't know if I'll get through all of it. Uh, I'm trying to, too. Thank you. So I think, uh, from my perspective, uh, we have a, a, a difficult challenge here as uh, the, the team trying to create a plan for this neighborhood. I think we have a tale of two neighborhoods uh, in a certain sense. We have the very distinctly small-scale residential uh, cross streets, if you will, the Santa Maria's, the Salada's, the San Jose's, that really reflect that character that the commenters described. And then we have areas, uh, the north and south throughways of um, Francisco, uh, and east of Highway 1, which is in the planning area as well, Oceana Boulevard, uh, and also Beach Boulevard, which um, Palmetto in particular does not quite have that same small uh, residential character. And so I think w if you look into uh, what some of the general plan and the LCP and their current drafts talk about, it's intensification along those north and south areas. Um, and there's really no discussion, which I take to mean leaving largely as is the uh, much more small scale residential um, cross streets. And so I think we need to do a better job of explaining that, um, that separation in the intent of this planning process and where we initially think the planning may go. Certainly we're early on and we haven't reached any conclusions in this specific plan. But when we talk about intensification, I don't think it's anybody on the planning team's uh, sense that we're looking to increase densities necessarily on the cross streets, really the residential core of the neighborhood. Um, and in fact, the existing general plan and LCP actually have a lot of medium and high density residential designations on those cross streets, which we hear increasingly from the community 
um, is difficult for them to support. They're alarmed and concerned when they learn that in fact they may live next to or across the street from a high density residential uh, area. And so I think we have that very much in mind, but maybe need to do a better job of communicating it and asking the right questions of the community. <coughs> um, when it comes to the question of the historical nature and character of the Sharp Park neighborhood, um, the fact that historical resources are very important to the community is certainly uh, known to us. Uh, we need to dig deeper with the historical society and others that may have expertise and information about um, more about the richness and s specific essence of what the historical character is of Sharp Park. I think a casual observer could move through the neighborhood without recognizing very much of the significance of the community. And we need to really hammer on what that is so that we can make policies that embrace and support and enhance that. Um, you know, certainly it's easy to recognize in many cases a historical structure or a landmark because it has notable architecture or, you know, George Washington grew up there or whatever, but that's really just one narrow classification of what a historic resource is. Certainly there are historic districts where significant activities occurred at important periods in history, and so it may not be a particular building but a collection of buildings that together represent historic significance. For instance, in our town, um, the uh, Ocean Shore Railroad and all of its different parts and the effect on our land use pattern and all of that could uh, constitute a historic district uh, in a certain sense. And I think perhaps others on the team might be able to weigh in on other variations of what that is, but it's certainly on our minds to, to try to flesh that out. And if we didn't do a good enough job of, of recognizing that in the ECR, that's certainly important feedback for us. But really that um, tale of two neighborhoods that I mentioned, it's, it's hard for, for everybody to grasp it readily, but if you look in the figures that are in the ECR, I think it, uh, a couple figures paint it very starkly. Pacifica overall, 78% of the housing units are single family residential, 22% are multifamily residential. In the planning area for the specific plan, it's 42% single family residential, 58% multifamily residential. And so certainly many of our uh, most engaged residents live in those single family uh, core residential areas, but there's a great many of our Sharp Park residents that live in multifamily residential units as well. And so we need to do planning for both groups and to make sure that we keep the community character and feel of this neighborhood with the right balance in the right parts of the neighborhood and protect those things that people value uh, and our reasons that they chose to live here already. If, if I could add to that, I just wanted to say that um, I agree with everything that Christian said and also when we're looking at design guidelines and looking at that, when we get to that portion of the specific plan, there are ways to be sensitive in terms of when you're discussing maybe using the term intensity, but being sensitive to the existing look and feel of, of a neighborhood. And we intend to do that as well. Test, it brings up for me the conversation, robust conversation we were having regarding specifically that one Salada site. And I feel like this brings up the idea of, and I personally don't have a dog to pick in the fight, I just, um, but what seems to be brought up is in a neighborhood such as that, are, is this the appropriate time to start considering whether or not we're gonna keep the look and the feel of the small, or are we going to um, look for, I guess the question is how, how flexible are we going to be for similar allowances that we seem to have gone through a long process of making in that instance, versus are we setting up an expectation from this point that it would be smaller. And again, I'm, I, I'm not living in the area, my historic uh, reference is not robust, but I feel like that conversation which took place over a couple of months regarding one very small lot, um, this seems like an appropriate place to maybe flesh out what an expectation for the neighborhood could be going forward so that hopefully we don't have that large scale argument over such a small lot in the future. Yeah, I think it's it's too early, and tonight's certainly not the right time to make policy formulations. Um, what's important to hear is that the existing condition in this neighborhood is such that there's a tension between uh, perhaps different historical um, stakeholders and residents and uh, community perceptions, 
and those of others that maybe have evolved over time that are reflected in the statistics of the neighborhood about multifamily versus single family. I think it's important in that the Salada Avenue project that you cited is the perfect example of not having the right tools for the job. We know that we have these very small lots that were created you know, more than 100 years ago, but we have land use regulations which don't allow them to develop in the right way to keep the character that people value in the neighborhood. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think anyone on this team is forecasting or projecting <coughs> that we're going to recommend intensifying to higher densities those uh, residential or primarily residential cross streets uh, for the most part. Um, but it's still too early to, to formulate those policies. Tonight we're just capturing what the neighborhood's concerned about and what the existing conditions are. Cool, and I just kind of wanted to point out that elephant to usher it out of the room. Um, the place that maybe could use a little bit more fleshing, especially when it came to the market demand study, um, I believe it was Deidre uh, was speaking about how the rail rail railroad car could bring in that economic pull for um, a sort of historic tourism, and maybe the uh, market demand study would be an appropriate place to reference such a thing. Um, also, Winter's Tavern at some point was brought up, which was the first time to my mind um, I understood it as being a historical landmark of some sort. I, again, my mind is not uh, as robust in terms of our history as I would like it to be, but if Winter's, for example, has any historical value, um, it calls up the question I had while I was reading it. So I'm reading about the restaurants and I'm reading about the cafes. What about the bars? And how far from a restaurant or a cafe is a bar in concept that we're not talking about the bars and the market demand? Um, and I don't know in the, if I saw in the market demand study specifically any mention of cannabis, um, but it seems like in and of itself, since it's um, a unique business so far in San Mateo County that we have here in Pacifica, that might bear mentioning in a ma market demand study. Um, those are a couple other thoughts I had. Also, when they were referencing uh, cafes and restaurants, there was Tea World that seemed to get left out, and I'm not sure if that's a restaurant or a cafe, but it seemed bearing. And um, what was the other one? The Slada Cafe? It's a restaurant in the area. It's closed. It's closed. Really? And the Tea World opened, uh, well, if it's the one on Francisco, it opened after we started preparation of this. If it's the one in Oceana, uh, Eureka Square? Yeah, Eureka Square. Okay. And I'm sorry to hear Salada's closed. Um, after that, I had a general question how we came to the boundaries of what Sharp Park neighborhood is, and if you could talk for a moment. Um, just at a glance, at it, just curious how those wound up being the boundaries here. So perhaps your question, I'm guessing, is in particular to the um, the, the east side of the highway. That that stuck out in my mind more than the west side, right. though also the west side, you know, could it be more north than it is? And within the, seeing it as it is, it, it intuitively makes sense to me, but. Sure, so that um, came from kind of a, a years of some council direction that we've received, although they've been preparing a work plan for only so many years, and either establishment of a Sharp Park specific plan or before that, a priority development area designation for the Sharp Park area had been a goal of the council's. Uh, and uh, since I've started here, they there has been discussions about including and recognizing the importance of Eureka Square Shopping Center to this area um, and the pedestrian connection which strengthens um, that relevance there. Um, and uh, for the PDA designations, which is a priority development area, it's a designation that ABAG has established and it connects density to transportation f and, and funding resources for planning and infrastructure. And so the idea was to also loop in some of the existing high density there that's up above Eureka Square, as well as the, um, the services and um, retail that's there within the center. And so there was just acknowledgement of kind of the, all of that direction and feedback that we've received over the years. 
And um, one last bit of feedback before I release the mic. Um, it seems like there was a lot of mention about the difficulty for pedestrians between east side and west side, but it felt like in the same breath the um, revitalized pedestrian overcrossing maybe could have been mentioned, and it seemed like it wasn't mentioned as much as perhaps it could have been. Not that it is the easiest thing in the world necessarily to get from east side to west side, but it feels like um, that pedestrian overcrossing maybe makes it a little easier, and it seems like it could be um, emphasized a little bit more. And now, done for now. Okay, Commissioner Campbell. Well, I just want to say I do appreciate the staff and the city really keeping the commercial quarters as they were. I think that's really important. I think there's a kind of a trend right now to um, really pack the housing in uh, everywhere, and I think it's really important to keep our commercial open. So I really want to applaud that and hope that carries through into the final plan. And um, I want to say that I agree with uh, Ms. Abbott's emphasis on keeping the bungalow type houses that are left in the area. I think that's important. I don't know if there's a way in the design. I, was, I just lost it and I was trying to find it, but in the, in the um, just the design part of this plan where they talk about uh, the sightings of, of houses and maybe there's a way to say that there's a, and buildings to say there's a preference for the single, for the wood um, siding as opposed to the stucco. I was down on Palmetto this weekend and you know in advance of this and grabbed a coffee, got a good pie, got a cute plant from that new plant store. I mean, it's, there's some stuff happening. But, you know, my wife and I were like noticing all the cool, you know, there's, a, there's, there's so much potential there. And it's the big monolith stucco apartment buildings and, and, and um, buildings that really kind of drag that area down. And if there's a way to at least, I mean, if we're up to me, I'd say no stucco. <laughs> <laughs> on Palmetto, I don't know if that's possible, but um, at least make a preference in the in the uh, the design for for wood siding. That's it uh, for now. Thanks, uh, Commissioner Nivlin. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and I think similarly, I had the opportunity. To, I, I actually like to run along Palmetto. I'll oftentimes park up by the uh, by the French Bakery and just sort of run down and. You know, one of the things that uh, occurred to me as I was on my last run was just sort of this notion of, having read some of the report anyway, this notion of placemaking. And uh, it's an important term, and it's one that I don't really feel like I understand as well as I could. And, it, you know, it just strikes me that that's something I would really think would, would policymakers and people who are looking at this would really benefit from is some, a little bit more uh, maybe about the science to the extent, I know it's partly science, partly art, of, of what we mean when we're talking about placemaking and the kinds of things that, uh, really um, helped to make that happen. And I was also just sort of thinking about sort of the integration of um, the north-south corridors that we, that we have, the um, beach and uh, Palmetto and then Francisco. I, I mean, I really don't view them in any integrated sort of a way. Uh, it, and that could well just be distinct to me, but you know, uh, things that could be done to really tie those um, corridors together, I'm, I'm e equally and perhaps more kind of mystified by how we deal with things that are on the other side of the freeway, frankly, and uh, how we sort of pull that into a kind of an integrated vision of the, uh, of the area. But I'd, I'd certainly benefit from more understanding about uh, how we, um, again, whether it's placemaking or whatever the appropriate term is, kind of integrate uh, whatever it is we're ultimately going to do along those corridors so that we're thinking about uh, them in a really unified way. and. Uh, of course, to, to uh, sort of um, dovetail on Christian's comments about sort of the two neighborhood sort of notion as well, and the sort of north-south corridors we're just talking about, then the east-west streets. And, uh, you know, in a lot of contexts and a lot of places, you'll have some buffering sometimes between different kinds of uses. Not really practical here where we're talking about, but thoughts on ways that we can really integrate or um, harmonize maybe the... Um, the uh, sort of what we're doing with the north north south corridors and and then the sort of the east west west neighborhoods so that uh, um, those things can can happen in a more uh, a harmonious uh, harmonious way. You know, the other thing, just on a, on a to, to change gears a little bit, I. You know, one of the things I noticed, uh, again, when I was on one of my runs, is that we do have some artists and artisans who operate in the uh, 
in the area and really be, and, and you know, whenever I've been to places that really focus on visitor serving, those are things to really highlight it, the, the galleries, whether it's the pottery or the, or the painting or, or what have you. And it just seems to me that really focusing on the kinds of businesses we'd like to see and encourage some that we already have and some that we'd really like to bring, turning this into maybe an artist hub and uh, maybe some things in the, uh, in the work we're doing of the plan we're putting together to sort of stimulate those kinds of things. And then finally, um, I, it's more of a question, really. I, I, one of the things is looking through the economic study, just seeing the real disparity between kind of the average rents in, um, in, in the planning area we're talking about versus the county as a whole. And it's a, actually a very large material amount. And I'm very curious about you know, some of the reasons for that. Maybe it has to do with kind of the age of the structures or just the fact that this is not a convenient place for you know, the typical higher rent paying um, you know, you, uh, tenant to to, to want to come, but I, that's that's something that maybe is, is just a question: is that, you know, what's up with that, and are there things we can do to to address that? So anyway, that's that's what I got for the time being. Uh, Commissioner Kresge. Oh yeah, um, just uh, circling back, Christian, on your earlier comment, um, what are we doing about engaging the multi? Uh, multi-family unit residents in the, in the planning process here um, for the Sh Shar Park uh, neighborhood. Are we doing any uh, unique uh, engagement methods to, to involve them more in the process? I think we, we have some work to do on that particular point. Unlike single family property owners, um, these folks don't easily get direct mail that we can put together readily on a list. Um, we've engaged some of the significant property owners as a first step and we hope that those relationships will enable them to support getting information to the tenants. We've had su some success in doing that to then get tenant um, mailing address lists and so forth. So we are working through that process on the traditional notification front. We've also uh, really tried to up our game with the quality and content and time of placement of some of our social media posts so that folks that may not be engaged or be getting the mailed notices have that opportunity to get digital notification of these meetings. Certainly many of the, the renters and multifamily uh, residents learned of our uh, Home for All process as well as our Plan Pacifica neighborhood meetings. And so through word of mouth and through getting those folks on email lists and following our social media, we've had increasing success but not enough yet on, on reaching them. And if the commission uh, has any suggestions on how to accomplish that, we certainly um, we certainly want to make sure everybody can take part in this process. Okay. Um, just to follow up, also on one of the public commenters' uh, question earlier about the streetscape um, on Palmetto, are there any plans in the in the phase two to incorporate uh, trees um, on Palmetto? So um, this is a, the Palmetto Streetscape impro Improvements is a project of the Public Works Department, so I am not as dialed in on what is involved exactly in phase two. I can certainly inquire about that okay. with my colleagues. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think this process presents a unique opportunity for, for this neighborhood in that, um, I mean, at least for me, I would like to actually see a, some emphasis or some uh, more discussion about the redevelopment of the area um, with higher density units, multifamily, and architecture that's different than the existing architecture. Um, I, I look at neighborhoods in San Francisco, um, where I've spent a lot of time, where there's a mix of very beautiful historic buildings, Victorians, Edwardians, and also very modern houses and buildings that are kind of intermixed with them. And I think that's actually a, a, a great way to redevelop an area. Uh, it doesn't have to be completely harmonious in, in, in sort of a, like a, a UNESCO or historical district where everything is the same from like two, 300 years ago. That's not the neighborhood that we have. It's, it's a mix of stucco buildings and, and cottages and, and other type structures. Um, so I think there are, are elements that we would want to preserve, the Little Brown Church and some 
characteristics. Um, but there's some that we would want to change. For example, the street trees on Palmetto. I mean, I think that's a would be a very great change. There are no street trees there now. It's not a historical part of the neighborhood. It hasn't been, but it's something we want to change um, to improve. Um, so I think generally speaking, um, density, redevelopment of existing buildings, uh, those cottages with higher use and, and, and higher rental income potential uh, would be something that I would like, actually like to see. I mean, we are 15 minutes from San Francisco, uh, 15 minutes from Noe Valley, you know, where you can buy a $10 million home if you want. Uh, so the fact that this area is so radically different uh, is, is uh, you know, I think there's an opportunity to do for us to have a, a better mix of income. And I think, you know, generally speaking, people here are concerned about that change and the gentrification type uh, concerns, but um, I think market forces should abound, and if people want to move here close to the city and have different opportunities for their buildings and, and housing, uh, you know, that should be part of this discussion. Um, and it could be a new way of looking at the, the district, uh, a more modern way, something for the future. Okay. Yep. Uh, uh, Commissioner Berman. <clears throat> So kind of bringing it back to the context of the existing conditions report, um, one item, I know I touched on it briefly with Christian um, over email. The parking counts, can we request that for figures 4-7 to 4-9, um, if resources are available, can can we understand the, the parking counts on um, the northern side of Sharp Park specific plan area. I know Salada Avenue in particular has been um, discussed often with development and parking. Um, also, I agree with um, Commissioner Nieblin said that this is an area with a lot of um, artists and artists work and kind of similar to how we improved the Lindemar area with all the, the children's artwork, I think it would be nice to highlight in the report um, the unique artistry that we have, both living and existing in the area, and that could also possibly help um, promote future development in line with it. So highlighting it in the report would be nice. Um, also, a uh, question, so given that we're kind of viewing Sharp Park area as like a, a hub of the city or maybe like our little downtown-ish area, um, where is our idea of the common entertainment place? I know when we have like Fog Fest, um, we close down Palmetto, which I know a lot of cities do that, like San Carlos does it with Laurel Avenue. Um, but I'm wondering, especially because we have the beach so close, um, is there an idea of maybe not currently, but in the future, a little area of community? So like Redwood City has the Redwood City Square. Um, is there a thought of that for the existing site right now and then possibly in the future? Well, we, we certainly haven't progressed to the point of um, sure. specific planning formulations for the neighborhood. I think as part of our Plan Pacifica community meetings, we've heard um, a lot of the same themes that we're hearing from commissioners this evening. One of them is uh, the suitability in many people's minds for more activity and entertainment spaces and opportunities for the community to gather. Um, outdoor music events, uh, art gatherings, and other ways to embrace this location and the vibrancy and richness culturally that it already has. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that will be on our minds as we move forward. So hearing, hearing that and reinforcing the public comments is really helpful um, so that we can keep that in mind when we develop the next phase in this process, which is the land use concepts. Sure, sure. And then kind of uh, taking that comment into Looking ahead to the future, I know we're focusing today on the existing conditions report, but um, I agree with most of what's been said. Um, possibly for the character of the area, um, sticking to the, the cottage, the bungalow, the, the wood um, siding, 
look would be, I think it'd be beneficial to the area. It'd be a nice stroll for someone visiting Palmetto to, if they have to park on Carmel, they could kind of take a look at, at other houses in the area. I know um, for Rockaway, we require the certain signage, the certain um, siding on the buildings, maybe a similar requirement for the area if, if economically feasible for developers would be nice. Um, yeah, and that's mostly what I have to say. Okay. Commissioner Berman, I did want to add that there, sure. on the existing conditions survey that is out there now, there is a question about where people gather and where they would like to see gathering mm -hmm. places. So we're hoping to collect input in that way. Awesome. I actually, I bring up that question because I had a discussion with the Menlo Park mayor um, and I, I mentioned, hey, we're, we're working on our general plan and we're working on our Sharp Park specific plan and um, Pacifica is kind of growing similar to how Menlo Park has grown in the year, throughout the years, Belmont. Um, are there any recommendations you have for developing our general plan to help promote the development we want to see in our city. And one thing that he said was, make sure you plan entertainment area because Menlo Park doesn't have as much of that to the extent that Redwood City now has. And it's been extraordinarily beneficial for Redwood City. And um, so it'd be nice to see, I think we have a lot of opportunity for it in Pacifica, along the beach especially. Um, so planning entertainment area would be great. As someone who works in Redwood City, I would just echo that that's absolutely the case. Coming out, you know, after work and uh, going to the courthouse square, and they've got a band going. It just brings all sorts of folk into that place. It really has created a, a sense of place, you know, mm -hmm. for uh, down downtown Redwood City that didn't have it before. I would I would say. Yeah. Chair, if we could uh, just maybe to touch back to Commissioner Niblin's earlier comment, I think Allison might have a few yeah. thoughts on the placemaking aspect of this and what some of the art and science uh, entails. Yeah, so there's an organization called the um, Project for Public Places that <laughs> defines placemaking as strengthening the connection between people and the places they share. It's both a process by which we can shape the public realm. Um, it's more than promoting better urban design. It facilitates creative patterns of use. And that, to me, is something that has kind of come up in the interviews that I've had with people, thinking about how people use these spaces and for example, along Beach Boulevard, some people were suggesting maybe some more temporary uses along there could help to really activate the space and create more of a draw. But placemaking really, it looks at where people gather already and how they use spaces in interesting ways already and then figuring out how to amplify that and make it more accessible to other people too. Thank you. I'm going to take a turn. <laughs> um, my first comment is is that uh, I would really like to have seen uh, the rest of Palmetto all the way up to Manor included into this plan. Uh, that's That whole stretch is completely underutilized. Uh, and by connecting two commercial areas, uh, we would have a, a, a much more vital and, and vibrant uh, commercial s strip for both of them. It's, it's basically, uh, you know, uh, just makes a whole, whole huge loop then where people have all kinds of things that they can do. Uh, so I, I would recommend that we expand this uh, all the way up uh, Pal Palmetto until we get to uh, Manor in terms of looking at things. Uh, in terms of the, um, the, the, the cottage look, I was, while I was sitting here thinking and listening to people, uh, I was recognizing there are two, two very big issues. One, we do not have any housing that is for low, very low, or extremely low people in our town. And if we wanted to readjust our land use on those small lots, we could possibly put in some uh, s more than one small house per lot 
uh, going along the lines of the tiny house uh, motif uh, that could, could be built to blend in. Uh, and then we would actually be servicing a very underserved uh, group of people in this community. Uh, other than that, um, everybody else has is, is, is covered things very, very well. Uh, and I'm very happy with what, what my other fellow commissioners had to say. And they have a couple more lights and they have more to say. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Campbell. Uh, just a real quick thing on, you know, we had uh, a couple speakers talk about the fact that the um, Little Brown Church wasn't yet listed on the National Register. And I'm sure you'll pick this up, but it'd still be worth mentioning that it's register eligible. So I, I hope that gets in there because that's still um, very beneficial to have that statement uh, on page 6-2. Uh, I, I, would, I would like to... Um, say yes, absolutely. I wish the specific plan carried all the way up the manor. I remember back in 2011, 2010, we had an actual um, council commission study session where we talked about upzoning North Palmetto. It, it is completely underutilized. We're fi the Commissioner Rubenstein's point, we're 15 minutes from San Francisco. That is on the coast. <laughs> The west side's problematic because of, you know, the bluffs and everything, but certainly the east side could have some really interesting things put on it. Um, I feel bad talking about this because he's not here. I feel like I'm talking about his back. I completely disagree <laughs> with him on that <laughs> we should have, a, uh, we should blow out the density in, in Sharp Park. I, I don't agree with that at all, but I do agree with him in the, the premise that we should have more housing. And I do, I've always thought on uh, the east side of Palmetto and North Palmetto that you could uh, storage units is a terrible use of that property, and uh, we should be upzoning that that whole area so that people could be putting in better, um, more uh, California coast um, appropriate um, uses. So I don't know if there's a way to do that, but I would certainly really be in favor of it. Okay, and Commissioner Big Stick. Speaking of gathering places and extending the map north around Palmetto, I actually spent a lot of time at the Trip Distillery, which is about as far north as you can go before hitting the Manor Shopping Center, and I agree with that feedback. I'm also interested what it would look like to push some of these boundaries more eastward um, in terms of maybe getting some more residential use in somewhere. Um, I don't know how feasible it is, but that was an idea that I decided to bring up since we're talking about going further north down Palmetto, which I think is a very good idea. Um, on page 94, it doesn't talk at all about C3 zoning, which I wouldn't bring up except on the map on 96. I think there's a very tiny little something that looks like it's zoned C3, so I'd be interested just for the sake of that one parcel. And being able to read a blurb on what C3 entails. Um, on the map that's on page 122, it talks about bike routes, but I was surprised I didn't see apparently any bike routes at Palmetto after we did the streetscaping and put in a bike lane. So that was something I noticed. Um, page 141 where it talks about upgrading old pipes. Um, one of the maps shows on Talbot apparently particularly old pipe that's there. Um, so I wondered about whether or not there's plans on replacing that apparently small section of pipe since it's on the map. And um, <coughs> back to anything conversation worthy on 156, we just start talking about hazards and I was reminded um, it, it occurs to me that there was direction when it came to the LCP to use a different term for hazards. And so I was wondering for this document if such an approach is appropriate. Now personally, I think a hazard is a hazard and I have no problem with that nomenclature whatsoever, but um, maybe consistency would be better as we're looking at it and whichever direction you all go, it seems like it was worth bringing up that that might be an issue 
as we start getting more community engagement at some point. Um, so just a little more th thought there if appropriate. And after that, there were a couple places where RVs were mentioned, which surprised me. Um, and I want to get to the right place number so I know what it was I was thinking at the time in which I saw it. There was something on page 86. Um, it, I think it's just talking about the conversation we've been having in town regarding RVs. And I'm not sure if, it seems like by the time we go forward, well, anyway. I'm curious why that, that bit about the conversation we've been having on RVs was placed in there. Is the idea that we don't think that conversation will be over by the time we continue forward in these, or it's, it's an active thing going on, so it, for that reason, it's an existing condition as of the moment we're discussing it. Is that the idea? Right, I think the vehicular housed situation is a part of the existing condition of the neighborhood and immediate surrounding area, and that's why we included a, a brief mention of it. It's an important uh, element to the experiences people are having and the condition of the neighborhood. Okay. And then um, on page 183, we're getting into the market demand study at this point. Um, but there's that one figure, figure 10, where it talks about mobile home or other RVs, vans, boats, et cetera. And it's talking about the total of occupied units. Um, specifically, these are the ones who are presumably owned by someone. So I was just curious if these are units that are occupied by people that are on owned land, or again, getting back to the discussion in the existing conditions previously, um, are these 59 units that are approximately what we see as being occupied when we take account? Because it, it seems like a snapshot rather than a... Well, for starters, these come from the American Community Survey. It's not the 100% enumeration census data. Uh, keep in mind that mobile home in, uh, potentially includes, depending on the boundaries, and Allison, maybe you can chime in, um, it may include the uh, Pacific Skies Estates, or now the cottages at Seaside Mobile Home Park, in addition to uh, potentially others uh, occupying RVs, vans, boats, et cetera. So it's not clear to me exactly the entire makeup of that, but I would suspect that's one of the factors. Now that I'm looking closer, it looks like that came from like 2017, is that correct? So their averages uh, gathered across 2013 through 2017. Uh, it's part of a statistical modeling process the census uses in between the 10-year decennial censuses. So again, it's not 100% go out in the field and survey everybody uh, data. It's a s sample of the population by census tract and in some cases block groups. So the data are somewhat noisy. I wouldn't put my finger exactly on 59 for that figure. What's important is the relationships and the proportionate relationships of these unit types and particularly how they change over time. And so uh, I feel good about the representation of the types of units that are there and the owner versus renter occupancies. But when you get down to f a less than 1% component part of a sample, it's hard to put a lot of weight in the numbers. Thank you very much. Commissioner Berman. Yeah, I wanted to mention, um, so one of the public comments was about the um, underutilized sites, and I actually did put my finger on that when reviewing um, the report. I'm wondering if we could uh, label that possibly differently because from, I know I had a question about it and Christian, you explained it well to me. Um, perhaps we could label that a little differently rather than underutilize, maybe identify it as opportunity sites, um, given that the idea isn't to demolish the site and rebuild over it, it's um, to really utilize the site, um, but without calling it underutilized. Okay, any further discussion from the commission? I'm not seeing any. I'm going to open up the public portion of this discussion again, if anybody has anything additional to say 
or if you haven't spoken before, you want would like to speak now, please bring, send a card up. Uh, and uh, you'll have three minutes for that time also. Uh, David? I'm not even going to try your last name. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, David Romain. Um, I'm going to echo the comments about the scope of the space that were that is being considered. Um, specifically, I'm on Paloma. I'm a resident. And Oceana High School uh, has approximately 12 swim meets per year and probably double that in the amount of uh, soccer meets. And so you're talking about outside people coming in, people coming from all over the peninsula. Um, and so I'm wondering how that is being considered as far as impacting the, the area, the specific plan area that's being considered and how those people might be encouraged to stay longer than just their, their visit for their kid, right? Um, I know there's a lot of consternation among the residents along my street. Some people put out cones, they get frustrated. They're like, hey, this is my public parking, whatever. Um, but those people don't need to be considered just transient visitors. They can be parts of the community. So um, I agree with the comment that the space between uh, basically from the north edge of the plan all the way up to Manor should be considered. And that I think uh, the impact of Oceana High School and the different public uh, events that it brings in should be considered as well. That's my comment. Thank you, sir. Uh, Jerry Crow, you, ha you have something to add to your earlier comments? Very good. Just a quick comment on the boundaries. At the end of Mirador Terrace, which would be the south end, is the castle. And I think that would be very appropriate to be included. It's uh, right at the shoulder of the marked off area for Eureka Square. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And it looks like I'm getting one more. Why don't you just come to the podium? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Shannon. Uh, I've been in a Sharp Park resident for about 20 years. Um, and what I have heard a lot from the community in terms of the quiet grumbling of people who never make it to these meetings, including myself in the past, um, is that uh, a lot of people have ideas about the kinds of businesses that they would like to see come to Pacifica, and somehow there's a feeling that they never get asked. Um, and so I hear constantly, you know, we would want a bakery. Actually, we just got a new bakery. Um, but those, that, the idea that this plan is sort of taking place without people being having a chance to share what kinds of businesses they would like to see in the community has been a source of frustration from dozens of people that I've spoken with over the years. Um, and so I don't know if there's a process for um, a survey like the one that you put out um, prior to this meeting to just get community feedback, but I think that even if um, the only result of that was to share it publicly so that business, people who are thinking of starting businesses in Pacifica would know that that was a business that was desired by the community. I think that would be very useful. Um, and when we talk about the, um, the hotels all the time, it seems like there's a lot of resistance to that idea in the community, partially because those are not businesses that serve existing residents. And so they are businesses that bring revenue and they are businesses that create public spaces and there are benefits to a hotel in a community, but I think that one of the reasons why I hear a lot of resistance to the hotels is that people wouldn't rather have a hotel than other businesses that they want. And there's frustration about always having to drive over the hill for basic services and things that they would like to have just here in town. So I just wanted to put that. Thank you very much. Okay, and I missed which light came on first. <laughs> now they're all lighting up. Again? I think you have one more speaker. Uh, no. Can you just repeat me and save a... Certainly, Cindy. 
small bit of a tree that we're gonna plant out there instead. Um, so I did wanna share there's some different ways of placemaking. I've shared a presentation with the Economic Development Committee and Parks, Beaches, and Recreation in the past about creative placemaking opportunities. And um, you know, some things to think about with that is you don't need a physical space, you can do pop-ups. You can block off part of a street or a piece of a street for a period of time. You can schedule a series of events and things to take place to bring people to an area. Um, and then you don't have an empty plaza, but you're doing little things and activities. Um, some of those would be really nicely suited for Palmetto, particularly to start bringing, um, when business start coming there, or, um, as we heard, there's more and more little things that are popping up there, so that's a way to bring people um, to an area and take advantage of the businesses that are already there. You might, want, want, you might not want to do that at the beach. Again, if you do not live in Sharp Park, it is really cold here. It is also extraordinarily windy. So um, Palmetto's a great place for that kind of activity where businesses might be, and then you can draw people down to take a walk along the beach depending on the conditions, but you can have activities and events on the street where the businesses are. Um, I'm a little concerned, I appreciated hearing the concept of, of um, you know, using maybe some of the small lots for tiny homes and the question of affordability. So, Sharp Park has been known as the affordable area of Pacifica and maybe for all of San Mateo County these days. So I'm a little concerned to hear that we're unhappy that our rents here aren't as high as in other parts of San Mateo County. Thank goodness Pacifica continues to offer and hopefully will always offer a place where people can come and live, where people who conduct services and our school teachers and our um, everybody else that's in a service industry has a home and that's what we're missing here right now. So thank goodness some of our rents here in the affordable part of Pacifica are still there. Um, one of the things I didn't mention earlier is that I'd love to see higher density development though and housing over in Eureka Square. Um, that property is just ripe for that type of thing where it's a little bit more removed from the neighborhoods to have higher views and things over there on the other side of the highway. The um, pedestrian bridge was always really well used utilized here in the neighborhoods, but now that it's been renovated, it's just always, it's very, very busy. So there is a really great connection, um, both with the sides and then with that new pedestrian walking bridge across. Thanks. And thank you. Uh, Commissioner Berman. And I mainly wanted to touch on, because I know um, there was a comment on uh, community outreach, especially to possibly people that are living in the multifamily units. Um, and it seems like both the, the public, the commission, and staff are kind of looking for ways to how do we reach out to people that don't always come to the meetings. Um, I kind of wanted to brainstorm about that, and I had a couple ideas, but maybe we could talk about it after some of your comments because it's a tangent. <laughs> okay, uh, Commissioner Campbell. I just wanna echo the um, support I have for the public comment we got about uh, really incorporating Oceana and its sporting events and the people it brings in into, the, into this uh, discussion because you know Oceana just, um, they just got a uh, boys soccer team um, and they've got their swim events and they've got tons of parents. They, they've got uh, all the tournaments now. Um, hopefully they're gonna get some lights. So there could be, <laughs> uh, <laughs> hope springs eternal. <laughs> um, but it, it really, it, it, we should, you know, it's a captive audience when they come here, so I, I hope we can kind of bring the specific plan, at least to incorporate that area. Um, and we do need more, uh, the kind of the going with the commercial space, uh, emphasizing the need to really make sure we have commercial space below all the new buildings that come in on that corridor, uh, not just, and not just token spaces, because I do hear that from uh, small business entrepreneurs, had a talk with a small business owner, couple weeks ago 
who was bemoaning the fact, she was bemoaning the fact that, um, you know, there just wasn't enough space and the spaces that, um, that do come up get snapped up very quickly. Um, uh, she said it, not me, realtors. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they get snapped up quick by people in the know. So there just needs to be more, um, more space. I think the demand's there. I'm going to speak to the uh, how to reach out, and uh, one thing uh, that might work, and it works for restaurants, is door hangers. Go to those uh, those multiple units and and put little notices hanging on their doorknobs. Say something's happening. Yeah, one idea that I thought was. Um, similar to Girl Scouts, which are really popular with their cookies, um, posting up tables at Safeway, or I don't know, has the planning department done something along those lines? Like set up a table where there's a lot of foot traffic? So the um, the farmer's market we've been yeah. to, that's and popular. And Fog Fest. Right, and the, um, the the engineering division did that with the bike, bike. and ped master plan at at the the manor Safeway. I, mm -hmm. I don't know that that was really well um, received. <laughs> well, I think people they didn't get a lot of people who stopped to talk to them. And I think it's because people are focused on getting their errand done, mm -hmm. and, you know, and getting back home. So, but it's a good idea, and we're we're open to other suggestions as well. Yeah. I don't know, maybe workout studios, like yoga studios. Um, I like the flyer idea, but the idea of just a piece of paper on everyone's door, it's a little um, concerning environmentally with just like how much wind there is. I feel like they may end up in the gutters um, unintentionally, so. You do the one where they put the seed inside of it, and then it. <laughs> we could. Ex it could be. It's compostable. There you go. <laughs> put uh, the seed. Yeah. I was gonna say the Oceana Market though, because if w it sounds like we're often talking about places we're doing tabling that are outside of the actual space we're talking about planning, but the Oceana Market is right there. Perfect. Yeah. Kind of in a major hub of it. Mm -hmm. And that's off the top of my head a major, um, maybe the library, I'm not sure how much foot traffic the library gets, but that's another spot that might see enough foot traffic to make it worthwhile. So I mean, we've, we've tried various formulations of pop-up outreach. Um, Tina mentioned a couple of mm -hmm. them. Uh, we have popped up at the library at various times. Um, we've popped up in other locations. Uh, it's a significant staff resource investment to sit and hope that enough people are there that are interested. Um, Allison spent several hours with her colleague at the, the farmer's market, which is great because we connected with about 20 people, but we've found we've had significant um, and much more cost-effective outreach and connections using social media and other tools. Uh, and so I think that's where our priority is right now, um, but we have through our Home for All program and some of the um, coordination meetings that we've had with other cities going through their home for all processes. We've learned some innovations that they learned like going to coffee shops not first thing in the morning because those are the people coming in and getting out. They're the commuters, right? But if you stay there and you hang out and start around 10 o'clock, those are the people that come and plant and they work there and they may need a break and they're willing to talk to you. And so there are different ways to go about it, but I'd say as a general matter, um, we've stayed away from the significant resource investment in terms of staff time. Uh, pop-ups, we've done it selectively where we think we can have the greatest impact, but to go out in the hopes of getting a couple people, we're probably not going to do that right now. Yeah. Commissioner Neblin. Thank you. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to echo, uh, again, sort of this really interesting idea of things that maybe lie outside of the planning area we're talking about, but that do bring in a lot of visitors. I hadn't been aware that Oceana High School, for example, uh, it had uh, such a large number of activities that could bring folks into the planning area, notwithstanding that that is outside the planning area. I'd say similarly, IBL, as I some, sometimes make my, you know, runs up and down, um, Palmetto, I see that they've got volleyball tournaments going on or basketball tournaments and uh, see a lot of cars parked in that area. And, and again, another opportunity for things we're trying to do in the planning area, notwithstanding that that lies outside. So um, maybe thinking through 
those things just to echo. Uh, the other thing that um, I really just kind of want to dovetail on uh, Commissioner Campbell's uh, comment and sort of this notion of um, retail space or commercial space, I guess more, sp more broadly, sort of the notion that there's so little of it, it gets snapped up quickly and people have a, a sense that there isn't enough of it. And uh, I, I would be curious to know kind of what's the optimum size that's actually needed to do something relevant and appropriate and desirable for the community. I don't know how big a, uh, an actual commercial space is really warranted or needed in order for us to be doing things that are efficient and uh, advantageous for the planning area. So that would be some data that would be useful to me as we get things come in in the future or as we're setting zoning standards uh, in the future just some minimum size of commercial space to be, uh, to be useful uh, looking forward. Thanks. Is there anybody else who would like to discuss anything? Yeah. Oh, Commissioner Bigstick. Um, so there have been a lot of comments on the, the sports part of Oceana especially, and if on fig, the figure one on page, 169, it actually details that as a potential addition to the planning area. So it sounds like it's not a bad idea to revisit that map that apparently is already there as a potential addition. And I also like the um, Jerry's idea of adding Sam's Castle. Um, again, I like the idea of uh, historic tourism and the revenue that that potentially could bring in. Um, it occurs to me as being a good idea. And that's what I got. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing any more lights, and I'm done. Uh, so uh, does staff need anything else from us? I think we're, uh, we're very appreciative of the commission and the community's feedback. We want to emphasize again the opportunity to take the survey. If you go to planpacifica.org and go to the participate tab, there's an opportunity to take the survey. It only takes a few minutes. You can complete uh, the survey in multiple sessions if you don't have time to get all the way through it. It doesn't take that long, but if you use the same device, you can come back later and finish it. Uh, additionally, uh, for folks that haven't read it, we encourage them to read through and provide comments on the existing conditions report. Both the survey and the comment period run through December 8th, and so we're eager to, to hear even much more than we received tonight. We certainly uh, have some work to do, and we're, we're grateful for, for the feedback. Thank you. And thank you for all your hard work. Yeah, I just want to echo. It's a really uh, comprehensive uh, report. I was really impressed by the scope of it. Yes, thank you. Okay, and now we're going to move on to communications. Are there any commissioner communications? Commissioner Berman? Yeah, so I had the opportunity on Friday to attend the South San Mateo County um, Leadership Program that's run by uh, the Redwood City Chamber of Commerce. And the topic of the day, it's a day-long seminar, um, was housing. So I kind of wanted to bring up a couple points that were mentioned throughout the day, and I'm sure we've heard many times before um, during our community outreach events. Um, so the event was kind of hosted by not only the Redwood City Chamber of Commerce, but HIP Housing, Home for All, um, Assembly Member Mark Berman, no relation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some key points that I think are relevant to us on the commission as well as city council are that... Um, the biggest roadblocks that they find that developers and HIP housing and Home for All find are um, basically the political will. So they kind of outlined in order to develop housing, especially affordable housing, you need land, you need money, and you need political will, with, which comes with the community support. Um, and just kind of an example of some of the difficulties that I know we have on the commission and council has is that um, a lot of the community that often opposes development and opposes 
housing, especially affordable housing, are more vocal in um, public settings. Um, so I think it, it is really important that we reach out to the rest of the community and hopefully other commu community members that might be in support of some development come and show their support. Um, and I mean, just as an example, over the past couple of years, the state has wanted more housing in the San Mateo County area, of course. Um, as we all know, they've they've passed SB 35, uh, 330, and SB 50, all um, trying to streamline uh, housing being built, especially affordable housing in San Mateo County. And it's to the point where if certain cities aren't able to develop enough, the state is interfering. Um, one example that I read up on was in San Bruno. Um, the Mills Park mixed use development that was proposed, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but um, the developer had a really great idea that um, proposed a lot of housing, affordable housing, a grocery store, I think, some really cool community benefit items with the development, but um, it was denied at council, um, and given the the new bills, the developer is still pursuing development, but they're going to pursue it in a way where it does not have to go to public review. So it'll just get streamlined and approved, and it's probably not going to have this cool grocery store or all these other items that the the community could have benefited from and planning commission council could have advocated for and required and worked with the developer but um, given that the state is imposing so much pressure on cities especially in San Mateo County to build housing if we don't take up the opportunities we can we may not be given opportunities to make our community a little better there may just be streamlined housing that we don't have any say in. So I thought that, that really touched me. Um, and I thought you guys might find it interesting. Commissioner Campbell. Uh, I got to attend Arbor Day celebrations in the Belmar district. Um, and it was, it was great. The uh, mayor came and spoke. Dozens of uh, residents came out, and volunteered their time, planted dozens of trees uh, in in the uh, in the district, including in front of the uh, school district house, uh, school district facilities, and um, it just shows how much I think um, community support there are for the tree uh, planting efforts uh, around the city, and so maybe it holds. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, an Arbor Day for maybe Palmetto, and, you know, or something like that, Arbor Day it could be arranged. Uh, it just seems like there was just such an outpouring of support for it uh, that it was it was really encouraging to see. So um, thank you. That was it. Commissioner Big Stick. Sure. I just wanted to mention that that unhoused and Pacifica task force meeting is coming up on Wednesday. Um, I'm not sure if the task force goes as far as addressing affordable housing also. I know that um, colloquially they're usually regarded in conjunction with RVs, which we're discussing um, as we're planning Sharp Park. So whatever the case may be, um, I know in some nooks of our community, it's a long-awaited public meeting by the Unhoused and Pacifica Task Force, and that's coming up at the Community Center on Crespi, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., and I want to make sure everybody has as much uh, notice as possible to be able to attend. Thank you. Uh, and I wanted to uh, apologize to everybody for having missed so many meetings recently. I've, I've been traveling the world. <laughs> Uh, I've been to Korea and I've been back to New England. Uh, all of this was around family things, some good, some bad, uh, but I'm done with that now and I will be uh, present at all future meetings. Okay, and uh, moving on to staff communications. So um, first, building off of um, Commissioner Berman's update, I did want uh, the commission to be aware of that we're, we are reviewing the various state housing bills that were recently 
ad uh, approved. Um, some of them are administrative in nature that we need to take care of them, um, and some of them are things that we need to be aware of and require future actions by the staff or the city. But most immediately, we do need to update our ADU ordinance again, and so, um, Associate Planner O'Connor uh, is going to be working on that. We plan to bring that back to the Commission for a recommendation uh, either next month in December or in January. Um, um, last Tuesday, the Council did have the second reading of the Reasonable Accommodation Ordinance, and that was adopted, so it'll be effective in 30 days. And they did have the first reading of the building codes and, uh, and approved the um, triannual update with reach codes included. And this isn't a reach code item, but I did want to mention that the standard building code update included provisions for tiny homes this time around. So there are provisions for um, uh, uh, ship's ladders, for example, and loft spaces and smaller spaces. Um, however, they do need to be on foundation still, so they're not going to be like uh, recreational vehicles. But I think that that's something that, at least in this community, we've been hearing a lot about and a lot of um, requests for, and so now the state has, has responded. That's it. On those reach uh, changes, um, does that also include uh, no, no new gas lines in houses, or has that been... No, so for certain appliances, so cooking, um, gas fireplaces, um, perhaps, you know, gas, um, plumbed gas um, exterior kitchens, mm -hmm. would could continue to use um, gas. But heating and water heating would be electric in the future, in new homes. In new homes. Yeah, it's not a um, impact to uh, remodels or additions. Thank you very much for that information. Uh, Commissioner Big Stick, you're... If there's nothing further, I'm ready to make a motion to adjourn. Okay, and Commissioner Niblin? I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Someone doesn't want to go home. He went home already. <laughs> uh, and so that passes uh, unanimously with all present sitting commissioners here. <laughs>